Okay, I think recording is going, so maybe we can get started. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, first things first, uh, at least one person just now communicated it might be helpful to have a little bit of extra time with exercise number two. Are there other people who are still finishing the second exercise who would like a little bit extra time? Yeah, okay. So, uh, what is it, Monday today? Um, could we say Wednesday by the end of the day? Is that enough time, you think? I don't want to push things too much if, uh, if need be, just because there's another exercise this week and that's kind of how the course goes. Good to not let things pile up, but, uh, but yeah, we could extend the deadline to end of the day on Wednesday. So again, if you've already finished the exercise and you're totally done, that's great. If you want to still update some things, you can do so before uh, end of the day on Wednesday. And um, yeah, I'll post in Discord too, although I think most everybody who's active is, is here now. So uh, okay, so that's, that's that. Um, otherwise, I think I'm feeling a little bit disorganized today because I came straight from two other meetings. Uh, but let's see if things get straightened out here as the court, as sort of the class session goes today. Basically, uh, we are now, we've had two weeks where we've been looking at things sort of roughly geostatistics oriented. So we've dealt with things like um, in week one, looking at calculating things like mean, standard deviation, and various ways to visualize things like the uncertainty in measurements. And then last week we were on to doing things about uh, calculating regression lines and goodness of fits and things like that. This week we're transitioning to a sort of uh, slightly different direction in that we're going to talk about a, an equation that is a fairly common equation used in uh, geosciences and many other fields, uh, and that is the diffusion equation. So for the next few weeks in the course, the idea is that we're going to meet an equation, and I'll give some kind of introductory lecture stuff telling you about how the equation is used in different applications in geosciences, and then you'll have an exercise where you get the opportunity to take that equation as it's written convert it into something in Python, and then play around with it to see how, how the equation works. So um, we'll see the diffusion equation this week. I think next week we see the advection equation. Then if not quite sure whether I'll update something for the week number five yet, uh, in the past it's been about viscous flow. So we look at like viscous flow of ice. And then the last two weeks are kind of linking some of these different equations and things that we've seen earlier in the course together um, to talk about a topic uh, that we'll introduce uh, already in this week's um, lesson. So I think, um, yeah, without much more delay there, we'll start into learning a little bit about the diffusion equation. Perhaps this week I'll try to remember to take a break in the middle of our time. I meant to do that last week and, I don't know, got carried away. So um, most likely what we'll do is we'll get introduced to a little bit about the diffusion equation, maybe start into um, the second part of the, the uh, lecture stuff, and then we'll take a break. And uh, when we come back from that, we can um, meet a couple Python concepts that you'll need for this week's exercise, things that we haven't dealt with before. So that's kind of where we're going, and uh, the lecture slides are not yet on the course webpage, and I haven't converted them into like a regular lesson on the course page yet. I've been thinking about this for a little while, but it's kind of uh, still easiest to have them in this form, which is as a set of, set of slides. So we'll get started with the idea of diffusion just first as a concept, and then we'll look at the mathematical way in which we can formulate diffusion, and, uh, and then we'll continue to the second part where we'll talk about thermal chronology, which is a, a dating method that I'm not going to assume you know anything about, but hopefully by the end of the course is something that you're a bit more familiar with. 
So as mentioned, this is basically a two-part, uh, more like lecture type um, introduction to the concept of diffusion, where we get the idea first and then talk about the math. And as far as motivation goes, maybe uh, it might not be so clear to you the different ways in which uh, the diffusion equation couldn't be applied to geological materials, but this is only a few options and there's really quite many of them. Uh, notably, heat transfer is not in this list, which is probably the most common place to use the diffusion equation because heat conduction is a diffusion process. But uh, here's a few examples. So this is just a uh, photograph of a, I think it's some kind of uh, uh, granitic myelinite. And what happens when you deform rocks at uh, intermediate temperatures in the earth where they deform by these kind of um, crystal plastic flow is uh, there are processes like grain boundary sliding, which is a way in which you are deforming grains within the uh, a rock sample, for, for example, here, um, that relates to the rock rheology that is basically a diffusion process at the large scale. It occurs um, on the sort of uh, atomic scale in the, uh, in the individual mineral grains, but as at the broad scale, it's basically a, a process that looks like um, a diffusion process in terms of how the material is deforming at the macro, macro level. Uh, there's also things like uh, various erosional processes, things that are shaping uh, hill slopes, for example. One of them shown here is rain splash, which uh, probably not the number one erosion process you think of when you think of how hill slopes are eroding. But individual raindrops striking a hill slope will basically fling some of the sediment that's on the slope out in every direction, and it tends that more of it goes downhill than uphill, and uh, as a result, uh, that also acts like a diffusion process in shaping hill slopes. And then what we'll talk about today related to this uh, dating method called thermal chronology uh, is, is also about diffusion. In this case, it's about a noble gas that's trapped within the crystal structure of um, a mineral like apatite or zircon. And in this case, helium is basically rattling around inside the uh, the crystal structure. It doesn't go into the structure itself, but it's basically trapped in there. And its diffusion out of the crystal uh, is a temperature-related phenomenon that is also a diffusion-type process. But there's many other examples we could list here as well. But in terms of the general definition, the basic idea here is that when we talk about diffusion, we're talking about a process that results in mass transport or mixing as a result of random motion of diffusing particles. So this definition might sound a little bit weird, but of course, I mean, the concept of diffusion is nothing unusual. Um, you know, if I had a bottle of perfume or something like that that I opened at the front of the classroom here, the sort of smell would gradually move through the room as a result of random interactions of the molecules that are in the air that's filling this room. And uh, it would take time to propagate from here to the back of the classroom. The concentration would get weaker as it goes along. But all of these things are basically a diffusion process, which is illustrated here in this little animation uh, that I found online. It's not the best quality image or anything like that, but it shows the basic idea that if we had something here like two different atoms, atom A and atom B, that were separated by some kind of barrier, in this case, this red line that's keeping them on, on either side of the barrier initially, if we have removed that barrier, and these could be you know, atoms that are in the air or atoms that are in some kind of fluid, they'll start to mix with one another. And what you'll see is that the concentration of the atoms of A, which is here on this plot shown by the blue line, is sort of constant and high on the left side of the barrier and basically zero on the right side. The concentration will start to change once the barrier is removed. And essentially, what you can see is that you start to get these yellow and blue atoms uh, as a result of random movement within the different positions in this structure. They start to kind of spread out and mix. And what you can see, for instance, here is the slope of the boundary between the two materials. This is basically the gradient in the concentration. And you can see that slope gets shallower through time as the two materials 
begin to mix. And if we left this go for an infinite amount of time, you would expect that eventually that becomes a horizontal slope where you have equal mixing of atoms of A and B um, throughout the entire volume of this, uh, this example block. So you can see that this, this kind of boundary of the edge of the atoms of A that propagates off to the right with time, and this is something that, that uh, is going to be the distance that that boundary is from the, uh, the sort of initial red line in the middle will be a function of the square root of the time taken, uh, or it's proportional to the square root of the time taken uh, since the process began. So that's just a very simple example of a, a diffusion type process. And again here, you can see that this line slope getting shallower with time. That's our concentration gradient. And diffusion reduces gradients over time. So whether this is temperature or whether it's concentration of different atoms, uh, it doesn't matter. If you take a really hot material and a really cold one and put them in contact with one another, what you're going to see is that the difference in temperature will gradually shallow out over time. So I guess probably the idea of diffusion in general is something that's already familiar to you. Um, we can be a little bit more quantitative in our definition. So we've called it a mass transport or mixing process uh, that relates to random motion of diffusing particles. And it tends to be that the areas where you have high concentration of, um, of material or, or mass or energy will diffuse into areas where that concentration is lower. So in terms of the heat transfer process, hot things tend to heat things that are colder because the energy is transmitted from the hot material to the cold material. And as noted already, this gradient that you would have between the two materials will decrease with time when they are undergoing a diffusion type of, uh, of process. <clears throat> now, if we want to make our definition more precise and perhaps even a bit more general, uh, diffusion occurs when a conservative property moves through space at a rate proportional to a gradient. This really doesn't mean much to me when I read this, uh, and I'd imagine it probably doesn't mean a lot to you necessarily either. But uh, in essence, when we assume that a process of diffusion is, is occurring with the material, first off, uh, we make some assumptions like a conservative property. Well, this could be something like conserving mass, could be conserving energy. So um, essentially, if we want to model something as a diffusion process, we have to have some kind of conservation law that is uh, ensuring that we're not adding or losing mass, energy, or momentum to the system, but that it's maintained. Uh, and then the rate proportional to the gradient means that this gradient that you have in the concentration between the two materials, like back here, the movement of the boundary off to the right will vary with that gradient through, through time. So um, movement occurs in direct relationship to the change in concentration. Again, uh, this is the kind of idea that you know, the most rapid change in temperature, if you have two materials, one hot and one cold, that you put together, the most rapid change in temperature will occur right at the beginning, and then over time the rate of change in temperature will go down um, as the two materials conduct heat between one another. So that can take us to the mathematical definition, which basically we just pick apart what was just written in the previous slide. So we have this definition that was given, and if we start with the second part about this rate proportional to a gradient, we can convert that from words into a mathematical relationship. And this will take us in the direction of what this diffusion equation is, is all about and, and what we'll do in the exercise uh, in applying it this week. So perhaps more familiar terminology for this rate proportional to a gradient would be to say something like the transportation rate is proportional to the change in concentration over some distance. So this could be about these atoms of A and B. Um, or it could be heat or whatever, but, uh, but this is a little bit more, uh, I don't know, like the way you might explain it to someone else with less um, abstract language. If we make that a little bit more quantitative, a transportation rate is basically a flux. And so if we have a flux that's pr proportional to a concentration gradient, a change in concentration over some distance is a concentration gradient. That's all that is. So 
now we're kind of moving in the direction of something that sounds more like an equation already. Flux is proportional to a concentration gradient. And already uh, we could start to put together some kind of mathematical relationship here, where if we call our flux Q, this alpha type symbol is uh, just a proportionality symbol. And we could say it's proportional to the change in concentration over some distance x. So delta C over delta x would be then our concentration gradient, how much the concentration changes over some uh, finite distance delta x. This is more or less one of the parts of the diffusion equation that sums up this part number two, except we have this proportionality in there, right? So there should be some kind of constant we can put in in place of this to now get something in terms of Q equals whatever. And uh, we can do that by basically making a substitution here where we take our general form of Q being proportional to delta C over delta X and we put in this, this coefficient D which is uh, called the diffusion coefficient or diffusivity and we can say that Q equals to or is equal to D times here now uh, delta C over delta X with the infinitesimal change. So this should be then some kind of uh, very small change in concentration over a very small distance instead of something finite with the capital delta. We'll denote this with the lowercase delta to be an infinitesimal change. So Q equals minus D times DC DX. The point in kind of laying all of this out is perhaps not so much to be um, exciting and engaging material, but more so just to show how you can go from something like one of these definitions in words to some kind of equation that then we can start to uh, try to understand how the equation is working and relate back to, for instance, this little diagram showing the concentration gradient changing over time. So if we have the example of uh, these atoms of A and B, we could basically formulate our diffusion equation in terms of the concentration of atoms of A and say our flux is equal to minus D times the concentration, the change in concentration of atoms of A over some distance DX. And you can see basically that where this concentration gradient is high, you see that there's a quick change in the concentration of A. So if we go just to the left of the red line, we see very quickly that the concentration of A is dropping down through time. Uh, initially, if we're somewhere far away from that boundary, we see the concentration is not changing because there is no gradient. It's a constant amount of atoms of A, so nothing's happening until you get to the point that you start to have some of these atoms of B in there and the mixing then starts to cause a decrease in the concentration of, of uh, atoms of A. <coughs> But, uh, but yeah, here we have basically a negative, uh, negative flux that results um, from the change in concentration going down. Uh, it's, I guess, actually positive flux of A, which means it's being moved away. So that's our first part of the diffusion equation, the sort of flux being pr proportional to the change in concentration over some distance. Why is there a minus sign? Does anybody have any idea of why there's a negative sign here for this? Yeah, so it always moves in the direction of, of decreasing concentration. So what we have here is a negative sign that arises because of that, you know, the, the way in which we're conserving energy means that the high concentration will always uh, decrease, the low concentration would, would for instance, go up. But uh, you can consider it basically by looking at two different points. So if we looked at some point over here, that's X1, where it has an initial concentration C1, which uh, would be maybe, we'll call it a value of, of 1, for example. And over here, we have a position X2 and a concentration C2 at that position that is basically 0. So this is the concentration of atoms of A. So over on the left side, you've got a just arbitrary value of 1, and on the right side, 0. If you plug this into the equation we have here, uh, you have C2 minus C1. So that's going to give us a value of negative 1 in this 
toy example, right? So concentration here is zero, minus one is gonna be negative one, divided by x2 minus x1. Well, if x is positive to the right, then this value is gonna be bigger than that value, so it's gonna be something, something positive, right? So you're gonna have a negative number uh, divided by something positive, so that's negative, multiplied by something negative, which is gonna give you then a positive flux of A in that direction. And so that's what, uh, that's what you would indeed see, is that you have material that's moving uh, off to the right, or delta C will be negative while delta X is positive, resulting in a negative gradient. And so that's how you end up with a positive flux, because the flux of the atoms of A would be moving to the right, so that if you're in this position X2, you see concentration of A is going up with time. Um, as a result. So kind of picking apart the different pieces of this equation just to give you some idea of how an equation like the diffusion equation works. Uh, I'm assuming that mathematically some of these terms and things are, are familiar enough to you. I mean, I guess using this little lowercase delta, have you seen that before as a way to indicate an infinitesimal change in some value? Yeah, okay. So if you have math questions, let me know. I don't think we'll do any integrations or anything like that. Uh, so hopefully we can kind of stick to mostly algebra in what we're looking at here. So that was that little piece about the, the flux being proportional to the gradient was the second part of our definition of diffusion. But there's the conservative property piece as well. And this one's a little bit trickier to translate into kind of normal English terminology, but uh, we could say, for instance, the change in concentration with time is equal to the change in transportation rate with distance. That doesn't really necessarily make things any easier. I think actually this one might be easier to see in terms of an equation, but, uh, but the rate of change of concentrations equal to a flux gradient, I would say also is kind of uh, weird to look at. <coughs> But in essence, what we see is that the change in concentration over time, so delta C divided by delta T, is equal to minus the change in flux over some distance delta X, which again, we can illustrate this maybe by looking at an example. But, uh, but this is the sort of conservation of mass part, says that if the concentration changes somewhere, um, then that must be related to a change in the flux of the material. So if a ch concentration changes with time, it's due to a change in the flux if we assume delta x is, is not changing. And essentially what you end up with is a conservation of mass or conservation of energy type uh, relationship. So you could ask yourself, how is this a conservation of mass or energy equation? And basically, again, if we think about it in terms of fluxes, we have a flux Q1, a flux Q2. Again, these are at positions x1 and x2. And uh, in our relationship here, you would have, for instance, q2 minus q1 divided by x2 minus x1. And you could ask yourself the question of what happens when the flux at q2 is larger than the flux at q1. So if that's true, then what you see is that q2 should be greater than q1. That means this top term should be positive. q2 minus q1 is positive x2 minus x1 is positive because of the way that we defined the, the axes before, that the values of x2 would be further to the right on our axis than x1. So positive, positive, though that's going to be a positive number here, but then there's a negative sign here which says then the concentration over time should go down if the flux at point q1 is higher than the flux at point q2. And uh, I think we could see an example of that, for instance, here. Maybe I can try to pause it like this. That if we're at one of these points here, and we go to some point further off to the right, or let's say we start out at a point where we're up on the flat part of the concentration, and then we have some point over here, you can see that because there's a slope here, there should be some flux of material away from this point. And uh, what that should mean is that the conservation of uh, mass would mean that as this goes down, then there should be material that's moving uh, off to the right from the 
left side where the atom A concentration is constant. And over time, if you let that play out, what you do indeed see is that the mass over here is slowly moving off to the right, uh, swapping spots with some of the atoms of B, but in essence, the mass from A is moving to the right side of the red line initially. That was the boundary between the two. Um, I don't know whether that makes sense as a kind of concept, what's said here, this kind of conservation of mass, but essentially this is a kind of way in which you can say um, the conservation of mass is, is to be upheld. Of course, for the whole system, you could say that the concentration uh, over time has to be zero for the whole thing, but at any given point, the concentration could be changing as, um, for instance, here you see the concentration of the atoms of A going down uh, just to the left of the red line and going up just to the right of the, the red line. But as a whole, the total amount of, of mass of atoms of A in this whole block doesn't change through time. So. Um, Basically, what we're saying is that if the concentration goes down over here, it has to go up somewhere else. That's how we're conserving mass. So there's no atoms of A that get to escape out of this box and disappear off to wherever. Uh, if it goes down, the concentration decreases here. It should go up, uh, for instance, to the right side of the red line. Or if it goes up over here, it must mean that there's a proportional decrease in the concentration on the left side of the red line. So, yeah, does that kind of idea make sense? I'm not super convinced from looking at people's faces. So I guess I would like to know if there are things where I could possibly clarify this a little bit. Um, we'll also come to playing with the equation a little bit uh, in the exercise, so it might not be crystal clear right now, and it might become more clear when you have a chance to test things yourself. But, uh, but in essence, the idea was to take apart this definition of diffusion and look at the two pieces to see how we end up with an equation that uh, simulates a diffusion type process. So are there questions about this at this stage. So maybe by show of hands, how many of you feel like you have some idea what's going on? Okay. That might be good enough for right now. So it doesn't need to be rock solid at the moment because we'll play around with some of the equations and we'll see how things work. Um, it's also, the, the slides will be on the, the course page so you can have a look again. Sometimes it just takes a little bit for some of these things to sink in. <clears throat> but just like we did before, the basic idea with the general definition we have is just to replace these finite changes in delta C, for example, uh, with the infinitesimal changes using the lowercase delta. And we could think about it in terms of concentrations of A, just to say that uh, delta C over delta T, so change in concentration with time, is equal to minus uh, dQ dx, or the change in flux over some horizontal distance. Which again, as I've said, basically says that uh, the concentration of A will change based on the flux across some reference face uh, or some reference position um, at x minus the flux across the same uh, at some position x plus delta x. And uh, again, if we're over here, the flux in um, at position x plus delta x is lower than it is at position x here. So if we just look, for instance, at some point close to the, the red line like this versus the point here, the flux over here is, uh, is lower than it is over here. So the flux at Q2 would be bigger than the flux at, or at, flux Q2 at position X2 would be lower than that at X1. So you would end up with a negative term here, which means the concentration should be going up, which is basically what's happening to the right side of the red line as you see the concentration going up. If you did the same thing on the, on the left side of the red line, perhaps you could convince yourself that that same uh, thing occurs in the opposite sense 
there because the concentration here is higher and lower there. So uh, you get just the opposite, that the flux should mean that the concentration of A is going down to the left side of the red line. So again, if it's not totally clear at this point, don't panic. Uh, you'll have time to play with this in the exercise. And uh, in some sense, I mostly just want to show you that these slides are here to refer to if you're confused about things about diffusion, because otherwise, uh, it's not maybe the number one topic I would want to get people excited about. Uh, mathematically, it's an interesting relationship, but it's, uh, it's perhaps better to see things in action. And yeah, with that in mind, basically that's our kind of next step is to, to look at an example of how understanding diffusion can be applied to a dating method called thermal chronology. And uh, I think time-wise we're in good shape to get started with the, the next set of lecture slides about thermal chronology. And, um, and perhaps again, some of these ideas about this diffusion process will become a little bit more clear through talking about that. Um, I think that's kind of all I want to say right now for this diffusion thing. But are there any questions about the basic concept of diffusion at this point? Okay. I'm a bit uneasy about that. Like, I don't know whether you're just completely so lost you don't even know where to ask a question or if you're tired or if it's November and you're giving up hope on life for the next month or whatever. Um, I just think that it will be clear when we start like, actually working on this. Yeah, I think that's probably the case, that to some extent things will become more clear as you play around with it. But, uh, but yeah, so I've been gradually including more and more thermal chronology to this course for several years. And in part, it's because it's a good way to integrate a lot of the equations that we come across in the course into a common um, task about trying to interpret uh, this kind of dating uh, methods data. Now, have any of you heard of thermal chronology previously? Okay, at least one person nodding to uh, okay, so a few of you have at least heard of thermal chronology. That's good. You don't necessarily need to know anything about it, but I guess um, maybe in geochemistry you would have at least encountered radiogenic dating methods. Yeah, dating like carbon-14 or uh, uranium-lead dating, things like this. And thermal chronology is not all that different from those kind of dating methods, but there are some important differences, and we'll get started in talking about those um, in this lecture and uh, <clears throat> we'll come back to that topic, not only in this week's uh, exercise, but also in the weeks that follow as well, uh, as we kind of link uh, to different um, aspects of what we have to think about with thermal chronology. But, uh, but yeah, as a topic in general, uh, why do people even use this thermal chronology dating method? Well, it's used, uh, in part because it's one of the very few methods you can use to date very slow processes like uh, tectonics and erosion that take place over millions of years. So in beautiful landscapes like this from the Pyrenees, um, if you want to know things about like the rates of faults that were slipping to uplift parts of this landscape or how quickly the landscape is being eroded by rivers or glaciers, um, you can see things with various dating methods that might give you time scales of maybe even years to tens of years um, to maybe even hundreds or thousands of years. But the problem is that these landscapes form over very slow time periods. So, you know, formation of a mountainous system like this could take five to ten million years, if not longer. And uh, there aren't so many dating methods that you can use to study those processes fairly directly. Uh, but thermal chronology is, is one of them, and we'll start to see how that works and why we can use it for these uh, slow processes in, in the lecture that we have here. But we have to make a distinction first between geochronology and thermal chronology. And the normal idea with geochronology in general is basically just a way in which we date geological materials. That's, that's a generic definition. 
But, uh, but there are many different methods in geochronology that are using these radioisotope uh, chronometers. And uh, so that would be something like uranium lead or uh, rubidium strontium, carbon-14. All of these different systems are based on uh, some kind of uh, radioisotope that you can use. Typically, you measure the concentration of it, and if you know what the half-life is, you can figure out how long did it take to produce this much of whatever the daughter isotope is uh, if I have this much parent isotope present in my crystal. So um, that's the kind of basic idea is that radioactive decay produces some daughter isotope. If you measure the concentration of the daughter isotope and you know the half-life, you can figure out how long it took to produce that much of whatever the daughter isotope is. So normally when we look at these data, like if we went out and collected uh, bedrock samples here and did the lab work to separate out zircons from the uh, bedrock, there probably would be a decent number of them in most of the granitic bedrock that we have locally uh, here. We could separate out the zircons and we could measure, for instance, um, the lead concentration in the crystals and also measure how much uh, uranium has been incorporated into the crystal structure. And that age that we would get would most probably give us something about the crystallization age of when that zircon crystal formed. So that's the typical way in which most geochronometers work. The idea usually with lead lead or sorry, uranium lead dating would be that lead is a big, heavy isotope. Once it forms inside the crystal, it pretty much stays there. And so um, all you're doing is just measuring how long it took to accumulate the amount of lead that's present in the crystal, given some concentration of the parent isotope. The difference with thermal chronology is it's basically the same system in terms of producing the daughter product, but the daughter isotope that's produced, or the daughter, it could also be a kind of a damage defect in the crystal, whatever the daughter product is, is something that is retained in the crystal as a function of temperature. So at high temperature, it's basically uh, lost from the crystal, and at low temperature, this daughter isotope or product accumulates inside the crystal. So it's the same basic idea. Radioactive decay produces some kind of daughter product, and you measure the concentration, but the concentration can be lost at high temperatures, which is where the thermo part comes in for thermochronology. So as a system, we basically have a few different pieces. We have a radioactive parent isotope, typically uranium or thorium. Those are the kind of most common, but it could also be um, <coughs> potassium if you're doing argon-argon dating, for example. You've got some kind of spontaneous nuclear reaction, so this could be alpha decay, which would produce helium nucleus, or it could be spontaneous fission, which occurs uh, for uh, certain uranium isotopes. So you've got the parent isotope that's radioactive. You've got some kind of daughter isotope or crystallographic feature, something produced by radioactive decay, and then the mineral in which this process occurs. So uh, oftentimes this is, is apatite or zircon, possibly um, a mica, that'd be another possibility, um, or fe some feldspars as well, but, but pretty common uh, rock-forming minerals. So you produce the daughter isotope inside the crystal, but the isotope or daughter product is something that can be mobile inside the crystal. So at low temperatures, it's trapped in there. At high temperatures, it may be lost. And um, I think I'll skip over the definitions of some of this, like thermal chronometry. Uh, but the, basically, the dating method is just the way in which we determine the history of the temperature of the rock based on the concentration of the isotope inside of some crystal. And then from there, the idea is to then link that to some kind of tectonic or surface erosional process because the idea is that if you're in some place where you have active faults that are uplifting the landscape, essentially rock is moving from deep inside the earth up toward the surface and it's cooling down. So at some point it should cross from the point where it's losing the daughter isotope or daughter product to the point in which that daughter product is being retained and then you can link that to uh, things like the rates of fault motion and other um, kind of erosional processes, anything that brings rock up toward the surface of the earth, where it tends to be cooler than the interior. Um, so let's 
have a quick look at the kind of essential idea, and then maybe I'll have a couple questions for you. So there's basically two, if you want to classify things in terms of like end members, there's two different behaviors of a thermal chronometer. So a given mineral can either be a closed system or an open system. The closed system idea would be that any daughter product produced inside the crystal is trapped inside of it. And of course, the open system is just the opposite, that when a daughter isotope or crystal feature is formed, it's lost to the uh, surrounding uh, area around the crystal. That's kind of what's meant to be shown in the diagram here. So you've got some parent isotope, which is in the kind of gray um, circles. And in the closed system, anytime you produce a daughter isotope, it's trapped inside this little hourglass looking thing. Uh, but in the open system, it's basically just falling out the bottom of the hourglass. So you don't, the concentration's not going up through time. Even though you're producing the daughter isotope, it's just being lost uh, typically by some kind of diffusion um, process. And uh, the basic difference between these two behaviors is a function of temperature. So this is the kind of high temperature behavior where there's more energy um, in the crystal because it's at higher temperature. The atoms in the crystal might be vibrating more. The sort of ability of the daughter isotope to make its way out of the crystal is, uh, is higher because of the higher temperature. And then the kind of colder system where you're basically trapping things inside of the host mineral. Does this idea make sense to you? I don't know if you've like this kind of temperature uh, effect on diffusion. I mean, it's, um, you can probably think of, of various examples of how you could, uh, you could simulate this in, uh, in real life. I don't know if I can come up with a great example right off the top of my head, but if you imagine you're trying to, for instance, um, let's say you were cooking some kind of, uh, I'm not a big fan of red meat, but let's imagine you were cooking something like a steak like a thick piece of meat and you put it onto like a grill surface. If the grill's cold, you might, let's say, have the grill set to a temperature where you'd like the, the meat you're cooking to eventually reach that temperature to be safe to, to consume. If the grill's cold, it's going to take a long time for that heat to transmit through the, the meat that you're cooking from one side to the other, or I mean, let's, let's imagine you can't flip it over for, for some reason, but you just let it sit there and cook. It's going to take a long time if you've got a cold grill. If you have a hotter grill, of course, the heat is going to move more quickly through the system. And it's a bit like this with this kind of open versus closed system behavior. The faster that you're allowing the heat to transmit through the system is more like the open system, which is occurring at high temperature and the sort of very slow heating and slow movement of these daughter isotopes would be what's happening in the, the closed system behavior. They're still moving within the crystal over time, but it's just the rate of movement is much slower because the temperature is lower. Um, I'm trying to think if there's another good example of something like this, uh, but I have to admit that I'm not necessarily at feeling my sharpest right now to come up with a good example off the top of my head. But in essence, this is the picture here. It's the kind of losing the daughter isotope at high temperature, retaining it at, at low temperature. And as a result, what happens is when you look at the concentration of the daughter isotope, let's imagine we drilled some deep borehole into the earth, probably deeper than, than we can actually drill. Um, but Let's imagine we drilled to 10 kilometers depth, just for example, which is, is doable, but not, not very easy. If you were to take and measure the concentration of something like uh, helium that would be produced from the decay of uranium inside of a, a zircon crystal, what you'd see is near the surface, you would have fairly high concentrations of this daughter isotope. And that's because you're in this closed system domain. It's too cold for the daughter isotope to be able to migrate out of the crystal over time. It happens very, very slowly, but it's basically effectively trapped inside the crystal. And so what you'd see is high concentrations at these shallow temperatures. This is our sort of depth uh, 
versus uh, concentration plot. If you ignore the gray region for right now and just imagine we jump down to where it's hot and deeper, what you'd see here is essentially zero concentration of the daughter isotope. Because there, every time a daughter isotope is produced, it just diffuses out of the crystal and it's lost to the surroundings. Between these two, you have this gray zone, which is both uh, literally gray in this figure and also uh, metaphorically a bit of a gray zone in terms of data interpretation, where the concentration changes over this kind of fuzzy area where you have partial trapping of the daughter isotope. Up here, you're trapping everything. Down here, you're losing everything. And in between, you've got a mix of the two. So if you're inside this area, it's, I think, aptly named the partial retention or partial annealing zone. And that is because you're retaining some of the daughter product that's being produced and losing some of it. So you're in between this closed and open system behavior. And it makes interpreting your data a little bit trickier. It's much easier to interpret if you know things have been in this fully cold domain uh, because you know that you should expect all of the accumulation that occurred to have occurred uh, in that cold domain. If you were to do something like to, to date a lava flow, for example, <clears throat> generally speaking, lava flows cool pretty quickly, especially compared to these dating methods where you've usually got a half-life of, of millions of years. Uh, what you would see is across the entire lava flow, you pretty much would have consistent ages because everything effectively instantaneously cooled down. Um, and so all of the concentration you would have would be basically the time since that lava flow was at the Earth's surface and erupted and, uh, and then cooling down after that. So, um, yeah, I think I've kind of covered that. What we're going to deal with in this week's exercise is about this idea of what's called a closure temperature, which is an approximation of the point where you go from losing all of your daughter isotope to retaining all of it, or losing all your daughter product to retaining all of it. And this conceptually is just done by, in essence, drawing a line through the middle of this gray zone and saying, let's just simplify things, not worry about this kind of partial loss here and partial retention that occurs here, but let's just put a line in the middle and say, this is the temperature at which we go from losing our daughter product to retaining all of it. Uh, and this is something that's been already published like 50 years ago now in terms of a concept, um, but is essentially the, the foundation of what thermal chronology is all about, is this idea that we have an effective temperature where we can say, okay, uh, if we know the age of some material, it means it's the, the age since the rock was at that temperature. And um, it is certainly an approximation, so there's uh, some, some drawbacks that can come with that, but the definition is also simple enough that it makes it kind of easy to explore how these different thermal chronometer systems might work. And, uh, and that will be the basis of what we do for, for the exercise for this week. So um, maybe before we go any further, I'll ask, are there any questions at this point? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so like there's uh, the fission track dating methods are basically uh, based on dating or measuring the accumulation of the damage trails that occur when uranium undergoes spontaneous fission. So you take a uranium nucleus and you basically split it into two pieces that are charged in such a way that they repel apart from one another, and they essentially tear a damage track through the crystal lattice. And uh, spontaneous fission is not so frequent of an occurrence. Uh, I think it's something like, uh, I'd have to look what the half-life is, but I think it's, it might even be more than like one in a thousand um, decays that occur for like normal alpha decay. Uh, 
only one in a thousand would be like a spontaneous vision. It might even be one in 10,000. I can't remember exactly what it is. Um, but it's, it's a sort of relatively rare event, but because you have such a large um, nucleus that splits, it really just tears like a, a damage trail that might be something like uh, 15 to 18 microns in length through the crystal. And if you can uh, do a little bit of chemistry to enlarge the tracks, you can make it so that they're visible under a microscope and then you can essentially pick an area, like a reference area in the crystal and co count the uh, concentration of the tracks as a way to measure the time it took to accumulate that number of tracks, making some assumptions about how frequently the uh, fission should occur. It basically anneals the damage. So it's the same like, you know, metals, if you heat them up, will anneal damage. Crystalline material will also uh, anneal the damage at higher temperatures. So um, the temperature at which the annealing occurs will depend a little bit on the crystal that you're looking at. But uh, for apatite, for example, typically at temperatures of more than about 120 to 130 degrees uh, over geological time, that will heal the, the crystal damage. So you're looking then at the concentration of these fission tracks that occurred below temperatures of maybe 110 to 120. Uh, for zircon, it's a little bit higher, maybe somewhere in the range of around 200 to maybe 240 degrees for uh, the temperature at which the annealing is occurring. Um, and I mean, this is something that's actually one of these somewhat controversial topics in a sense in thermal chronology because the way in which the tracks anneal is not fully understood. It's not like they just go from being long and sort of shrink just from one end, but they can kind of pinch closed in different places. The annealing behavior is, it makes it so it can be a bit challenging to interpret the data, especially in really old rocks. Like the fission track dates from Finland are quite controversial because they're, you know, it's, it's questions about like over 700 million years, how stable is a fission track at surface temperatures? I mean, it could be that they're, annealing extremely slowly, but they could still be annealing even at low temperatures. So it's, uh, it's a bit complicated. But what I can say is that it seems to work as a dating method. So uh, although it might be complicated, I mean, there's a lot of uh, work that's been done with fission tracks that have, have shown that, you know, it's, it's consistent with other dating methods and sort of fits the geological history of a lot of areas. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it gets a little bit tricky like most dating methods when you get to older materials. Uh, but, but yeah, that's the basic idea is this fission tracks. I think in maybe the last week of the class, I at least have some lecture slides that talk about the different dating methods in a bit more detail. They're more there for like a reference for the final report for the course, but, it's, um, but if you're interested, we'll, we'll cover some of that stuff. Uh, I've been thinking for a while whether it's worth it to have like an actual thermal chronology course as part of the curriculum, but it's a method that's not used very much in Finland, so it kind of feels like to have a whole course on it would be a little bit misleading to the students who might get excited about the potential for doing thermal chronology and then realize that like no one's really doing that here. <laughs> so it's used much more in younger landscapes uh, and, and kind of younger tectonic areas. But. Uh, are there other questions about the kind of concept of thermal chronology? Because if not, I might suggest maybe we take a five minute break now, get up and stretch your legs and uh, we can continue at like, uh, well, at least on that clock, 20 past. So let's take five minutes and then we'll continue with the rest of this lecture and then Look at some Python stuff and then look at the exercise.